Awesome. Hey, good evening, guys. So good to see you here tonight. Hope you had a great day today. Everybody had a great day. Awesome. We're going to um, receive the offering. So if you have an offering, hold that up and the ushers are going to find you. While you do that, let me remind you of a couple of things. First of all, this is our week of prayer and fasting. So if you are available anytime from 6 a.m. until 9 p.m. tomorrow and Friday, the church will be open and you're welcome to come up, hang out with us and uh, spend some time in prayer. Um, spend some time uh, just connecting with God and, and connecting with one another. So keep that in mind. Also, don't forget this Sunday, Sarah Foreheads will be here. And so we're super excited about that. She always um, does an amazing job. Every time that I hear her speak, she always comes with a word from the Lord. And so I know that Sunday is going to be an amazing day. So make sure that if you're in town, be here. If you're not in town, catch us online. It's going to be a great, great day on Sunday. Also, one other announcement. We are looking for some help on Wednesday nights on our media team. And so if you're here typically on Wednesday night and you would like to volunteer to help with that, you can see uh, Pate Duggar and he will help you. All that entails is basically you um, back at a computer putting the words up to the songs, okay? So that's really, really easy to do. And um, it makes such a difference for people who don't know the songs. They don't know the music. Um, they are able to connect with God through worship. So it's a great way to serve. So if you are interested in helping maybe once a month to run slides on Wednesday night, make sure to see Pate, and he will get you all the information that you need to get you plugged into that. All right? Woohoo! Make sure you check out the website. Lots of stuff coming up. We have the fall party coming up. We have a um, picnic at Bennett Spring. A lot of fun stuff that's happening. And so uh, get it all checked out. Pastor Kevin is ready and ripping and roaring. Are you ripping and roaring? That sounds a little dangerous. No? Okay. Pastor Kevin is highly anointed in favor of the Lord. Is that better? That's better. Okay, okay, okay. That's better. Ripping and roaring? Not good pictures come to mind when I think of ripping and roaring, but that's all right. Anyway. Yeah, I've got myself in trouble there too, so. Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? I think we need to say, sing happy birthday to Lindsay. Okay. But. But we're going to do it, we're going to do it how I used to do it, kids pastor style, okay? So we literally just sing happy birthday and you sing it in the most god-awful tune that you possibly can, okay? But in order for it to be really good, you got to all participate, okay? So on the count of three, we're going to sing happy birthday to our fearless worship leader, Lindsay, okay? And just happy birthday, that's it. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday. She kind of she kind of gets a bad rap because her birthday is September 11th. All right. Yeah. So I like to make it really special for her because you know, we all know not so special things happened on September 11th as well, and we certainly don't want to forget those, but we're not going to forget her birthday either. Thank you. You're welcome. That's been really cool. I've, uh, Pastor Larry and I both have been out here early praying in the morning. Um, he takes the outside. I take the inside, basically, I guess is how it's been working for the most part. But, uh, and I've had my buddies, um, I about said Ariana. For some reason, I say Aurelia and Ariana intermix. So I'm sorry. They're, they're in my head all together. But Aurelia's joined us some. Lindsay has been there as well with me praying, our, our prayer partners there. So uh, feel free to come out 6 o'clock in the morning um, before you go to work. You're, we'll be here. Um, it's, been, it's been a really awesome, awesome time. So tonight, I want to introduce a new series that we're going to spend a few weeks on. And this is something, honestly, that has been really dear to my heart. And I hope that tonight... I, I've got so much going on inside of me that I hope really that my words come out effectively, so pray for me. Uh, but I really want you to see something tonight 
that I think could be a game changer for some of you, um, if not life changing to some of you. Some of you, you may already know this, I don't know, but we're going to dive into it even deeper. So I think there's something for all of us on whatever spectrum you are that you find yourself on tonight. I think you can relate to this. And I think it's something actually that is uh, the reason why it's so, t- um, um, it's so dear and, and heavy is a bad word, but it's really, it's really um, important to me um, is because I think it's a very timely thing personally. I mean, it's obviously we can't predict things and I am, I don't profess to be a prophet, so don't get me wrong there. But at the same time, I, I believe, I believe God is doing something in the earth today. He always has been, but I believe that we're living in times. How many remember the scripture that Paul said that he looks forward? There's a day that he looks forward to, he longed to to be in. And this was a guy that was seeing dead people raised, that was planning, how many churches did did Paul plant? I didn't look this up. Do you have any idea, Pastor? Okay, I don't don't know, a lot, okay? He was a, a, a very prominent apostle. Uh, which is church planners really is what an apostle means. Someone with that apostolic gift was, was ones that planted churches. Um, and, um, and, and the days I believe that we are, we are entering in are the days that Paul looked forward to and wished that he was alive in. And so what I'm trying to tell you, church, is these are exciting times. And yet I feel like a lot of us aren't that excited right now. Some of us may have been, or a lot of us, if not all of us, I've talked to a lot of people. Pastor Larry and I both speak to a lot of people in the church. And we hear lots of things that are, when people are at their lowest, that's when we hear about it. Yeah. Now we hear the good thing, news too. But it seems like lately the bad news has outweighed the good news. Yeah, for sure. Just being honest. But I don't want you to get so much in the negative that you lose track of what God is doing. And so I want to, that's why I believe this is a timely word. I believe it's, it's, it's a great word for you to take home tonight. And it's something that maybe some of you didn't even think of before. But anyway, before we delve into that, I want to lay some groundwork just really quick. And I want to look into the lives of a few people. I think most of you will recognize and maybe even remember some of their stories, if not all of their stories. There's lots of Bible scholars probably could get up here and teach better than I could tonight. But um, the first one I want to look at is David. How many know David? David's dear to my heart. You know, he was a man that started out with a call in his life from a ruddy teenager, teenage boy. That Samuel pinpointed him and said, you are going to be the king of Israel. And it didn't stop there. He went on to defeat the, what? The giant Goliath, right? I mean, you talk about a high. I mean, he won the king's daughter, right? Saul's daughter as his wife. He he won a place in the palace of the king. So we know David's story, but in 1 Samuel chapter 22, that's after all of that takes place. It says in verse 1, David left Goth and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. Now normally... You know, an army of 400 men sounds like a lot. Sounds like a good thing, right? If you had 400 soldiers, good strapping soldiers, maybe they're they're, they're Marines, maybe they're Green Berets, maybe they're Navy SEALs. But he had men who were in trouble or in debt or were just discontented. He had discontented misfits. And he was in the back of a cave running for his life. That doesn't sound like a promised king and a warrior defeating a giant, Philistine giant. Guys, David had low points. I believe this was maybe one of his lowest points right here. In a back of a dark cave with 400 misfits. We read the story of Elijah. 
Elijah. How many remember the story of Elijah? This is one that probably is the most, one of the most prominent stories of Elijah and how he stood up to the prophets of Baal. I remember that story. I mean, I loved his attitude. I, I, I just feel like I, I'm, when I get to heaven, I want to hang out a little bit with Elijah. Because, you know, when he, he, he was talking to the prophets and he said, you call down fire from Baal first. I'll even let you go first and, and, and then I'll go. And what, what did he do? They, they kept cry, crying out to Baal and he wasn't answering. What, what did he say? He said, well, well, do it a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's taking a nap. I love that. I mean, it was just, I don't know. I, well, my wife says I was a good boy until I met her, and she's the queen of sarcasm, so I guess it rubbed off on me. But I don't know. I just, I just think I love Elijah. And here he, 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 you know, Baal does not show up after much, I, I forget, hours go on. I mean, I, I think it was half a day or something. I can't remember. I didn't look the, up the whole story of that part. But then what happened? He called that, oh, he said first, he said, pour water on it. No more water. I mean, he just, he just put a river on his offering. He called it down, and it not only consumed the sacrifice, it consumed like what? A bunch of the Baal, prophets of Baal all at the same time. Yeah. Boom, they were gone. What, you were giving me a number? 400 and what? 50. And then after that, King Ahab, we pick up the story there in 1 Kings 19. It says, when Ahab got home, he told his wife, Jezebel, everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the pro all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servant there. Then he went alone, on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights. I want that food, by the way. To Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what? are you doing here, Elijah? Yeah. We think of that story of how God supernaturally performed and he came down and, and, you know, all of these things came down in a whisper, right? He wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the, the I, I, I'm summarizing here just because I'm, uh, for time's sake. But finally God spoke to him. But what did he say? What are you doing here, Elijah? When I hear that, it's usually because I haven't done a good job. Yeah, sure. What are you doing, Kevin? Yeah. How many like to hear that from your boss <laughs> or your wife, your spouse? And there's John. John was a, well, he was the disciple that Jesus loved, Right? John was close to Jesus. I mean, he was right there. He was all about. And we read the book of John. I always, I always tell every new Christian when they start to read the Bible or someone that says, you know, I haven't really read the Bible. I'm starting. I say, start with the book of John. Why? Because the book of John, John paints, portrays the love of God like no other gospel. John knew how to love and yet, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, John writes and says, I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. You see, right before he wrote this, the Romans had attempted to kill John 
by throwing him into a boiling pot of oil. He miraculously survived and then was banned to the island of Patmos. It was a volcanic island that was home of banished cr criminals and political offenders. An ancient Guantanamo Bay, if you will. Most likely, John wrote the book of Revelation from a cave on this volcanic island. Here was this disciple that Jesus loved, close to Jesus, spending all of his time with Jesus. Tried to be killed. He should have been a martyr. But he survived a boiling pot of oil. That sounded like a good day. And found himself in a cave on the island of Patmos. For all the bad people. Then we have Saul. The scripture I want to read tonight is in Acts chapter 9, but Saul, later will be Paul, but Saul, just before the scripture, I remember the story of Stephen and how Stephen was stoned, martyred for preaching Jesus. Summary of the story. And what did the stoners do? They laid their coats at Saul's feet. Saul gave approval for everything that went on in the stoning of Stephen. And Saul found himself on his way to torture, kill more Christians. And it says, Meanwhile, Saul was uttering, uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters and addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what to do. The men with Saul stood speechless. For they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up, the up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now we think of Saul as a bad guy, but Saul was actually very zealous in his beliefs. He had went through the Jewish order. He was a very scholarly man. So what he thought he was doing was the highest thing he could do for Yahweh. And now he found himself blind and did not eat or drink. Even though all these people we just mentioned found themselves at a low point in their life, do you think, do you think God called them into ministry? Raise your hand if you think all of these men were called into ministry. Yeah, that's most of your hands. I'd agree with you. But yet, look at what happened in their life. It doesn't sound too peachy. Does it? So my question is also the title of tonight's teaching, Are You Called to Ministry? Maybe you're here tonight and you feel a tug in your heart to do more for God. Do you feel like you're called to ministry? Maybe you feel like you would never be qualified for ministry because maybe it, it scares you. I've seen a lot of people on both extremes. One side is like if you call... You know, I have actually, I've actually sensed and seen uh, a calling on someone. I asked, do you, do you think God is touching? <laughs> Not me. And then I've had others come up and talk to me and say, man, I feel like God is really tugging on my heart. And the first place they run is the church. Because they feel like they're called to be a pastor or a teacher. They want to they they preach from the pulpit. 
Because God has just put something inside of them. But before we can really answer the question if you're called to ministry, I think the first thing we need to find out is what is ministry? How many agree with that? What is ministry? Well, really, the text for tonight is going to be found in Ephesians chapter 4. And it says this in verse 11. It says, he has appointed some, and this is Paul speaking to the church in Ephesus. He has appointed some with grace to be apostles and some with grace to be prophets and some with grace to be evangelists and some with grace to be pastors and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. Oh, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Pause. Hold the phone. Time out. What is this? Keep that scripture up there. Would you, would you keep that one right there? Now, so many people think Pastor Larry's the one in ministry. Pastor Kevin's in ministry. We've got church staff. They're in ministry. Folks, that's not scriptural. Now, doesn't mean that Pastor Larry doesn't minister to people. Or, yes, I have ministered to people. But really, these are what? They're grace gifts given to the church to nurture and prepare all the holy believers. How many believers in Jesus? How many Jesus followers do we have in the house tonight? Okay, I see most people's hands. The rest of you come up here. We'll get you saved after church. Okay, at the end of the altar. We'll do an altar call tonight. Now, I know most of you, I think you're pretty much most saved. Some are just bashful or lazy, one of the two. I won't say which one. Not bashful. I'm just joking, by the way. Please don't be offended by that. (laughs) I love you all. So if you're a believer, it says that all the holy believers to do their own works of, what's that word? Whoa. Now other scriptures or other other translations says that, um, that all of the grace gifts are given for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. That's new American standard, I think, because that's, that was the Bible I kind of grew up on. So those are the, that's what I got the most memorizations of the translation of that in my head. But I loved how this, how this said, because I love how it says the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. Guys, I think We've got this backwards. It's not the pastor's job to get people saved. It's not the pastor's job to make disciples. It's the pastor's job to equip the church to go into all the world. I'm getting ahead of myself here, so I'll I'll stop. Okay, so let me go to the next point. The the point that I want to make tonight is ministry is not for pastors or teachers. Ministry is for disciples. How do I know that? Jesus, before he left the earth, he said this to his disciples. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Say disciples. Matthew 28, 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to teach? Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, He told them, this is Jesus speaking again, Go into all the world. And who is he talking to? The disciples. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. That sounds like the gospel. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. It's not the pastor's job to get someone saved. I don't need to get them to church and get them to the altar. I don't need to, to get my grandson, you know, pull him by the ear and come up, bring him to the altar and, and bring him to Pastor Larry. No. It says, um, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, giving you, and be sure I am with you. No, I'm in Mark chapter 
Okay, anyone who believes, sorry, I lost my place. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. Don't, that, that, a lot of that's figurative. Okay, don't try that at home. All right. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Mark, and then drop down to verse 20. And the disciples went everywhere and preached and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. Who was doing this? The pastors, the teachers, the disciples. Oh, but they're way more religious than I am. You know, they're a disciple. Do you know what a disciple means? Follower of Christ. So let me see a show of hands. How many in the building are a follower of Christ? I'm going to probably have less hands because you don't want to raise your hand. You're chicken. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. I'm joking again. All right. Lighten up. He doesn't stop there. Mark 6, verse 7, it says he called his 12 disciples together. And who was it again? The what? Disciples. Okay, just making sure. And began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. It's very generous. Verse 12, so the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn back to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick, anointing them with olive oil. Guys, Jesus sent out the disciples Not pastors, not teachers, not evangelists, disciples. And the disciples went out telling everyone about Jesus. Anyone in this room, we already asked that question. I'm going to go bypass that. I got it ahead of my notes here. Disciples are called to do their own works of ministry. And we already established you are a disciple. And you are called to make disciples. You know, Sunday, Pastor Larry asked for a show of hands of how many were saved in church. And he said, and it looked like from what I could see, I I agreed with him too, that the majority of the hands were raised, okay, that they were actually saved in a church building, in a church setting, in a church service or experience, okay? And I don't have any problems with that. I think it's great. The majority of the church was saved, or majority of our church was saved in church. But in five years' time, I would like to see this place full of folks that if that same question was asked again, you all that raised your hand would be the minority. Yeah. I would love to see it flipped. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Why? Because you are going out and you are telling of the good news and you are laying hands on the sick and you are casting out demons and you are bringing them to this house, filling the, the seats around you tonight. There's a lot of empty seats in here. We got a lot of room to go. We got a lot of work to do. Next point. Ministry is not for the perfect. Ministry is for the surrendered. Ministry is not for the perfect. You don't have to have your act all together. You don't have to have five years of Bible school or theology or or seminary, I mean, or anything, a degree in, in theology. You don't need that to be a minister. All you need is a heart that's surrendered. We last left David running for his life, hanging out with 400 other misfits in the back of the cave. And if we read just a few pages beyond where we left him, we would find out he even had the opportunity to kill Saul in that very same cave. But yet he made a choice. He made a choice not to Because he didn't see Saul 
as the man that was out to take his life, he saw Saul, the man called and anointed by God. And because of that decision, I believe, him surrendering all of his life, all of his morals and values, that instead he showed him mercy and grace. And because of that, God had mercy and grace on his life more than once and restored him to his rightful place as king of all of Israel. Why? Because I believe David came to God surrendering it all, honoring him above all else. The same God that he defended before he took out five stones and slayed the Goliath saying that I come with you not with sword, I come with you in the name of the Lord of God of Almighty, of whom I serve. That same God is the God he honored in that cave. And that same God is the God, because he had surrendered everything, gave him that rightful place over all of Israel. David wasn't perfect. He'd go on from being king, not perfect. In fact, he made some really stupid mistakes that cost him dearly. David wasn't perfect, but he was surrendered. And God restored him. Elijah would leave the cave to obey God and anoint Elisha to be the next prophet to follow in his footsteps. And there's story after story after story to the point of where Elijah never did see death. He just disappeared. That'd be quite a story. <laughs> I want to sit down with Elijah and hear that one. Someday, not today. Saul, who would receive na a name change and be made known as Paul, would have an encounter with a man named Ananias whom the Lord would speak to concerning Saul. And we see this in chapter 9 of Acts, verse 17. Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers, the very people he had just crucified days before in Damascus for a few days and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is indeed the son of here was a murderer of Christians who would go on to not only minister to others about Jesus, but to plant more churches probably than any other apostle. Yeah. And to write two-thirds of what we would later be known as the New Testament canon. John, who we left in a cave on the island of Patmos, surviving a boiling bath, would find himself worshiping. Verse 10 of Revelation 1, it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a voice, a loud voice like a trumpet blast. It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands. Look at this. And standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of God. I feel like he said someone like the Son of God because John knew what Jesus looked like. But he didn't look the same. Because the glory that he had laid aside, he had once again picked up. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. Whew. 
that verse will preach. I'm not going to get into that. His head and his hair were like white, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead." But he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys of death and the grave. Saul suffered a lot. But he didn't die in that boiling oil pot because God wasn't finished with him yet. He had a purpose. Not only did John get to see this wonderful image that I just read for you, that would have made it all worth it and way more than some. But he would go on to write all of Revelation, a book still highly studied today. As Reverend Sharpless would say, in conclusion, tonight... I want you to know God has work for you. And you don't have to worry about how you to do it. You don't have to worry and fret about what it's going to take. God has work for you to do. You are called to ministry. He has a purpose and a plan for you. You don't need any qualifications. You just need to surrender. All he needs is a heart that's willing to say, here I am, Lord. He wants to use you just like a vessel. Vessel doesn't require much except to be emptied. But the good part about that is, is when it's emptied, he'll fill it with all of him. That sounds like a really good place to be. There's a day quickly approaching, I believe, where God is going to use you and all of us to make disciples like we've never seen before. Jesus said for a reason, pray for laborers. Because even back then, Jesus said, for I see the harvest is white. As I believe there's a tremendous harvest. And now is the day to prepare. I believe that with such an urgency inside of me. We have to stop staring at the distraction because I believe we have been on a distraction after a distraction after a distraction. And there are so many people sitting in here going through distractions right now as we speak. It could be a trial, it could be a tribulation, it could be a life-changing event, it could be critical, it could be death and life, or family members in the middle of death and life. We have to stop staring at the distractions and start trusting in the one who overcame every obstacle and gave us that same power and authority to overcome the obstacles in our lives too. My Bible says in Matthew, seek first the kingdom of God. Folks, I think sometimes we have got our eyes off of what we should be focused on. You know, my dad used to, when he was teaching me driving, my dad used to tell me when I'm turning a corner in particular and I start to look around and make sure no one's coming, he says, what are you doing? Look where you're going. Look where you're going. Why? Because when you look away from where you're going, guess what? You're going to go that direction. Wherever you look, you will eventually go. Where's your focus? Are we so caught up staring at all of our distractions that we have lost focus on seeking the kingdom first? 
Because that's exactly what the devil, our adversary, would like to do. He has a whole life full of distractions, trials, and tribulations to keep you busy until the day you die. But let me ask you, is that the kind of legacy you want to live? Is that the kind of legacy you want to leave? Or do you want to leave a legacy that says, I carried my cross. I kept my focus on God. Because when we seek first the kingdom and we keep our eyes on him the whole time, the whole time, guess what? He can take you through every obstacle. He can take you over them. He can guide and direct you if you keep your eyes on him. But the moment you get them off on the distractions, you lose your focus. Because that, how do I know that? Because that is, that scripture is your guiding light. Seek first the kingdom. First the kingdom and all these things will be added to you. All these things will be taken care of for you. I see that scripture and what always goes through my head is I keep my eyes focused on what God has for me and he's going to take care of the rest. Keith Green has an old song about that. It's really cool. I won't start singing that now. Don't get me distracted. We have to stop staring at the distractions and start trusting in the one who overcame every obstacle and gave us that same inner power and authority to overcome obstacles in our lives too. When I start getting busy for Jesus, Jesus gets busy for me. Because guess what? The only thing I can do about my problems most of the time is worry. And yet while I was walking the parking lot this morning, the Lord led me to Philippians chapter 4 and it says, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. Why? Because worry doesn't do a thing for you. And prayer does everything for you. You see, God has called you to a ministry that only you can fulfill. When it says, go you into all the world, I believe, and I know that, that you can tear that apart. And I know because I went through the, the missions program at Rama Bible Training Center. And that word world means nations, which is actually people groups. And I understand all of that. But you know what? I also think that some of those people groups and nations are the people that you run into that only you will run into. Your nieces and your nephews. Your grandma and your grandpa's. Your aunts and your uncles, your cousins, your second, third, fourth, and fifth cousins. Even the gal at the cash register where you go to get your coffee at the convenience store. Yeah, I got your number. Guess what? He or she's in your world. How are you reaching out to him? Her. How are we touching everyone else? Do you know what I love? I love Dave Ramsey's little saying, how you doing? Better than I deserve. Why do I love it? Because it gets people's attention. I always forget to say it. I got to reprogram myself. It gets people's attention. You know what I like to say and I don't always remember to say it? Not have a great day. Make it a great day. Because you have the power to do so. You can choose what affects you and what doesn't affect you. I can choose to have a bad day or I can choose not to have a bad day. And it's not based on my circumstances. Yeah, I may walk through some trials and tribulations. I may walk through some storms. I've went through some before and guess what? Jesus got me over them. So why not keep my, my actions towards him and make it a great day because this is the day that the Lord has made. And he doesn't make junk. He doesn't make bad days. I'm the one that has the power to turn him into a bad day or not. Do you see what I'm saying? It's all of these little things that you don't know how many people are watching you. And when we get caught up in so much of the doom and gloom, guess what? That's the light you show. But when we choose to have the joy of the Lord in our hearts and we choose to count it all joy, as James says, when I come into virus, various trials and tribulations because I got the eye on the prize because I know, no, this sucks right now, but guess what? It's only temporal and it's not eternal and Jesus is going to take me over it and that's what leads me to maturity. Are you with me, church? 
You have got to stay in the word to get yourself encouraged because the enemy will give negative after negative after negative every single day until your cup is empty. But when we stay in the word and we fire ourselves up and we choose to make choices and we dwell on the right things in our heads instead of focusing on the bad things, which I call distractions, the enemy wants to keep you spinning like this all day long, the rest of your life going nowhere. But Jesus has a plan for you. He has given you authority to follow that plan and to see it happen. And most of the time, the times when he has used me to minister to others, it was easy. I make things difficult. It was easy. Because the light just shines. A vessel just holds stuff. It's pretty easy, folks. Unless we get distracted. God has unleashed you to do your own work of ministry. Let's just talk about the elephant in the room. I had someone contact me this week. Today, I guess it was. This morning. I said her heart is hurting. So many familiar faces are gone from our church. What's going on? And you know what? I don't know all the answers. But I do know a few things. I do know that God is shaking. I do know that God is aligning. And I've got two things. One of two things I can do about it. I can either get in the down in the dumps about it. There's days I've done that. Didn't help. Or I can get determined to fill that seat that's empty. Because this town is full of people looking for what you have on the inside of you. And they can fill that seat. You can fill these seats. If you minister to one person, you bring one person to church, you've just doubled how many people are in this room. If we do two, we've just quadrupled. You see how the math gets really big really fast? And it is a lot of work. It's just us doing our part. Knowing that you are capable. Not only are you capable, capable you are well equipped. Abundantly above. Exceedingly. If you don't know, go back and listen to some of the messages I've just, just reached or preached on. God has unleashed you to do your own work of ministry. We've got five minutes. I asked Pate. We're a little down on our worship team tonight, but I asked Pate to play a little worship music because I want to open up the altar tonight and I'd love to pray with you. I don't have to pray with you. But this is a time, a week of fasting and prayer. And I'd love to see people come up here and bring all the stuff, the distractions, the cares. I've talked to enough of you. I know they're in the room. Bring them to him and leave them here. And ask him to realign and reprioritize things in your life to equip you and to ready you to go out there and be the church that he's called you to be. That we could lay down those things that we have been carrying for way too long and leave them right here, draw a line in the sand and say, God, I surrender. I surrender to what you have for me tonight. And I'm not talking about a dream team position tonight. I'm not talking about being an usher tonight. I'm not talking about Pastor Larry made a, made a push for media people. We need them. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about you doing ministry out there. 
Because I think so many times I have seen young people, I've seen other people that have felt this tug and call in their heart and the first place they run is the church when I think, I think you need to run there. There's only so many people we can bring up to teach on a Sunday and a Wednesday. There's so many Bible study teachers and groups that we could do. And, and I'm not saying maybe God is leading you to do some of those. But I think a lot of times we miss it because he's really wanting to pour into you so that you can change your workplace. That you can change your boss. You know, I had a, a dream in high school. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 16 years old. And I carried a New Testament Gideon Bible in my back pocket. And I was radical. And my goal was to win my whole entire high school to Jesus before I graduated. Now, that sounds really lofty, but I grew up in a small Iowa town, and that's 150 kids, so it wasn't as lofty as what it may sound. And you know, by the time I graduated, I had led two to Jesus personally. But one of my youth, that I was my first job in, in the church was actually a youth pastor in my father-in-law's church in a little town called Brighton, Iowa. And one of my youth came back to me. He was sixth grade, seventh grade when I was youth pastor went back to visit after we had moved away and he was like 18 he was in high school and he said you know what he said HLV that's the school I grew up in HLV is experiencing a tremendous revival in their school I was like it just made me get goosebumps and I'm not going to take all the credit for that but man it sure made me feel good that prayers do work some that maybe I had just a small part of that and guess what? Any part is worth every part. So tonight, we're just going to put some soft music on. I want some prayer time here just to focus, just to allow God to minister to whoever needs to be ministered to before they 